going to happen. Uh, there's lots to get to. Let's get to it first. Pierre Polyev is talking, and he just released uh, on the 27th yesterday. There's two bits of content that he released. So this is a 15-minute doc mini documentary. I guess it's like a full documentary. 15 minutes is a full documentary. And then there's a, the a sit down, a fireside chat, and I'm looking for the fireside chat to show you. Um, oh, it's in a different tab set. But Polyev is putting out a lot of content this Christmas season. And that's notable just because I think there's an election coming. So very interesting. This detonation argument is interesting. And the medium for making the argument is well used. He's out ahead of everybody else. Everybody else is still copying what Mr. Polyev was doing for his leadership campaign, because that seemed to work a treat to get a whole lot of people excited about him. So the other politic, or the, the other parties are are trying to copy his his successful strategy, right? But you can't just sit back and use that successful strategy again and again and again because it gets old quickly, right? So Polyev is innovating, and this is interesting because he's putting out a lot of content. Um, also notable, he's got Aaron Gunn, who does all those documentaries on his team. So he's, well, on his team, he's got him as a, as a minister, right? Or a minister, somebody who's potentially running in the, as a CPC um, candidate. So maybe he's helping, right? But fundamentally, these kind of documentaries, people like them. Here's some of this documentary. The argument is well made and nobody else is doing this. So it's interesting. Here we go. You had noticed the constant ticking sound at your house and you took time to investigate and you found the time bomb. Would you just go on with your life and pretend it wasn't there, hoping it wouldn't go off? You might be right. Maybe it would never go off. That ticking sound in Canada is the debt bomb waiting to go off. Here's the simple math. Total household, corporate and government debt is more than 3.5 times the size of Canada's gross domestic product. That is higher than in the United States during the subprime housing bubble that would later burst into the 2008 financial crisis. Traders here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out waiting to see how low the Dow will go. They're focused on the Dow, not so focused on... Higher than in Greece during that country's debt crisis. Fearing for their jobs, threatened to commit suicide by jumping from the window ledge of their office in Athens. Both and higher than in 45 of the 48 biggest debt crises around the world in the last century. If our debts are so high, why has there been no crisis so far? The answer is that interest on our debt has been at record lows for almost a decade and a half. Sure, rates have risen in the last 18 months, but those increases have only begun to apply to a share of our total debt stock. Much debt, such as fixed rate mortgages and long-term government bonds, have not come up for renewal. As time goes by, that debt rolls over into higher rates and the servicing cost will gradually rise. Canada has a total of $10.2 trillion in personal, business, and government debts. That includes credit cards, car loans, mortgages, small business loans, government debt, etc. $10.2 trillion works out to $255,000 per person, or nearly $620,000 per household. The average interest rate we are currently paying on all forms of debt is 4.72%. However, the average over the last 61 years is 7.6%. So what happens if at some point down the road, the interest rates paid on our debt return to their normal, historical averages. Well, it would raise Canada's interest costs by nearly $294 billion a year, which is almost as much as Canada spends on health care, more than 10%. So there you go. I'll leave it there. Um, it's interesting. It's compelling content, easy to watch, and it goes by quickly, especially in two and a half speed. People will like it. People do already like it. And they think that he's, that Mr. Polyev is telling it to them straight. Christia Freeland is trying to counter this by saying Polyev's conservatives continue to show vote after vote, video after video. They stand for reckless cuts and austerity. Our responsible economic plan allows us to make crucial investments in, Canada, in Canadians by, backed by a AAA credit rating and the lowest debt to D GDP ratio of the G7. And it says, well, Gary says, in today's Fun with Figures episode, Canada's finance minister pretends Canada's national debt is not over 100% of GDP by ignoring provincial debt. In an honest world, this would be called disinformation, but we live in Trudeau's Canada. So percent of GDP, and, and they're trying to pretend that Canada is not in as in debt as we are, but we are because 
the the provinces have debt too. And when you add the provincial debt, it used to be that the federal government had very little debt, $20 billion of debt, which is, is nothing, like very little. Harper had a surplus. And like, a, a, I think it was a million dollars. I think it was a million dollars because I don't think Trudeau was left with a billion dollar surplus, but I could be wrong because a billion dollars these days doesn't sound like much either. Anyway, regardless, the, the surplus was gone within a year and then Trudeau's, Trudeau's tax and spend policies became apparent. But when the deficits and debts of the federal government, which used to be nil or a surplus, are added to the provincial debts, then you've got, you've got a recipe for problem, at least a problem, a slight problem. Um, so here, the, the chart doesn't translate well to me explaining it, so I'll move on. But fundamentally, they're trying to mislead people through use of charts and figures. And it's it's gross. And it's typical also. Wall Street Silver is highlighting this part, part of Tucker's speech. He says, you live... Well, here, I'll just let him say it. You live in a society where the people... In oh, for crying out loud. Hold on. Okay, here's Tucker. You live in a society where the people in charge just want to sell you out to get rich. That's bad. But that's not what we're watching. We're watching something much darker than that. So the objective of, I would say, the entire administration and its enablers in the Republican Party, which is most elected officials there, is to destroy the United States, the recognizable United States, the country you grew up in, the country you've been living in, say, 10 years ago. And that's kind of obvious to everyone. But too few people pause and ask, well, what is that? Like, these people live here. They don't all have secret island getaways, especially now that Epstein is gone. And so if they succeed in their project of destroying the United States, where are they going to go? It's a little bit like burning your own house down. So why would you do that? That's not just an act of destruction. It's an act of self-destruction. I said last time insurance fraud, right? If you think that you could enrich yourself through destroying yourself. Here's John Voight. I think this is Angelina Jolie's dad. I think it's John Voight. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. Sometimes I get it wrong. Uh, and here he's talking about how evil the globalists are. I've got to check the speed. Um, he says, the globalists are Satan and we need to fight them. Here we go. My friends of all colors, races, and religions, this is now our greatest fight since the Civil War. The battle of righteousness versus Satan. Yes, Satan. Because these leftists are evil, corrupt, and they want to tear down this nation. We must not allow this. We must fight this corruption that has taken over and fight for the good that seems lost. Let us give our trust to God and fight now for Trump's victory because we all know this ballot count is corruption like they are. So let us not back down. Let us fight this fight as if it is our last fight on earth. As Muhammad Ali said, it's not over till the last punch you have. God bless. I hesitate to uh, hang the whole victory or loss on Trump, you know, him including Trump in that. I think generally I th he's correct. I don't know that Trump is the pathway to complete success. I have no idea. I have absolutely no clue. It seems that John Voight thinks that. I don't know that I agree. Um, but I think that generally the message resonates. The It seems that economically all nations are being attacked by their own government. Um, it seems that it, with in the um, mass immigration, all nations in the West are being attacked by their own government. Biden's a good example. Trudeau's another good example. There are others, England, the EU. Um, so it's it's very interesting to watch. The EU's, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, trying to send more money to Ukraine. So it seems like very, very clear that the people in charge are not working for us. Um, and so it seems like paying attention to, well, 
these interest rates and things like that. If the plan is to c collapse the currency and, and make people poor and dependent on the, go on the government, um, <clears throat> will they be able to pull it off? Will people tolerate that? Will Polyev derail that? He's claiming to, right? He's claiming to know the problem and the solution. So, but he's still talking about increasing immigration in order to build houses. Argentina, Joey says, Javier Malai just passed the, mo the most sensible law in world history known as the Art Artico 209. <clears throat> From now on, governmental institutions can no longer use the word free to promote any state service or function in, a, in municipal provinces or on a national level. Malai considers the use of the word free a lie and feels citizens shouldn't be lied to since the services are always paid by someone, typically tax dollars. If this were implemented in America, the Democrat Party would not be able to campaign anymore <laughs> because they can they use free all the time. Um, similar to the liberals. Uh, well, anybody in Canada as well, people who talk about free healthcare should be, and I often try to correct them, but they should be corrected to say like, listen, we pay for this and we pay more than Americans do. We do, we pay a lot more than Americans do. Um, so it's very interesting and concerning that people don't recognize that these free services are paid for and we get subpar service in some instances, right? Some other instances, you get great service. So it's not across the board. Here's Wall Street Silver. He's highlighting food prices. And this is just general cash money that people are feeling strapped. Bad policies leading to this on purpose. Here we go. Who else here is walking through the grocery shop right now, just saying to themselves, what the fuck is going on here? All the prices of pretty much anything is just getting insane. Actually, let's get a show of hands in the comments there of people who are actually starting to get stressed about this. Right. I, I was going through the grocery store. Greg and I had a conversation on Speaking Moistly last year, year ago, more probably. And I said, I can't believe how cheap food is. I can't believe how cheap food is. Look at the price of gas. I can't believe how cheap food is. And I think at the time, gas was more expensive, like 170 or something like that. And... He was saying, you know, it's so expensive. It's so expensive. I said, it's still affordable. It's, you know, it's less than 20% of people's um, monthly. And I think generally 40% is um, violent revolution territory. Now, I don't know if that takes into effect or takes into account rent prices. Like if rent prices are X and food prices are Y, food prices being 40% would, would be a tipping point. Because it used to be that housing prices being 40%, 36 to 40% was high, but then you would be in a situation where if your housing prices are 60%, which they are now, which is a lot higher, um, and your food costs are 40%, well, you don't have anything, anything for anything after that, right? So if that's the case, who knows, right? But right now food is only, I, th I saw a food professor saying price of, price of food as um, your total, average salary percentage across different countries in Canada was 10.6 something or 10.38, maybe 10.38. And so like people are, can still get by. And I think it's incredibly cheap considering the, the situation we're in. And I think they're going to make it harder. And I think that beef is going to be un unaffordable. And I've seen the price of meat going up. Price of meat is, is very expensive, but my chocolate cereal is not. Right, so I mean, processed cereal. I don't agree with that. I think that the the pork should be eight bucks. Like the it used to be four pork chops were eight bucks, and now it's much more expensive than that. But the chocolate cereal, when they made when they made it three for fifteen, people stopped buying. So they made it three for ten as a loss leader to get people into the store. Pretty wild stuff, right? So, what are you going to do? So there are things that are unbelievably expensive that are increasing faster than other things. Bacon, they're trying to make bacon. Bacon used to be cheap, like two ninety nine, and then and then it was five ninety nine. And now they're trying to make it eight ninety nine, seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine. They're trying to make it the the price of it seem normalized to everything else. But I mean, bacon shouldn't be that expensive for not even a pound of bacon. They used to sell bacon in five hundred gram packages, right? Back in my day, kids. Oh my gosh, the internet was free and bacon came in <laughs> More than a pound package, 40, 44 is a pound, right? I don't know, maybe. Um, so 500 grams. Oh, jeepers creepers. Those are the days you could get two salads out of that. Salad. Bacon salads, of course. Liz Churchill says, the World Economic Forum knows a financial collapse is coming as the central banks purchase a record high of 800 tons of gold in 2023. Didn't we sell our gold and our gold mines to China recently? Yikes, right? Economic 
catastrophe happening in Canada. And Jason's talking about a universal basic income. He says a universal basic income means socioeconomic slavery. This is nothing new. The same tactics have been used by every communist regime in history. The goal is to make you dependent on government for survival. This time around, though, the technology exists to turn you into a complete open-air prisoner. No need for labor camps when they can track you within a tiny district and keep you there without force. They will house you in buildings they own and hand you a check every month to buy your basics. You'll be required to have a digital ID and trade in digital currencies. They will control every aspect of your life. If you don't comply, they'll simply shut off your UBI, evict you from your home, and turn off your identity. That's what lies ahead if we don't stop it. So yeah, yeah, the UBI thing is very, very concerning. Let's talk about housing. I didn't find an article. I thought this linked to an article, which I was going to read because I'm interested in the hows and the whys. There's a picture and they look like a lovely, a lovely couple and they're standing in front of their chateau and there's a like a tower right? Like Beauty and the Beast Tower, right? And it says Made in Canada, Made in Canada says Canadian couple sells Ontario home and buys a castle in France. Quote, we sold our house in Fergus, Ontario and bought an 11 bedroom chateau in France. <laughs> Lovely. And there's actually a show uh, with Angel Strawbridge, Bert, I think it's Bert and Angel Strawbridge. Maybe I'm getting his, his name wrong. And their whole, the whole premise of the show is they went to France and bought a like kind of a medium derelict chateau, restored it, like it didn't have electricity. So he put uh, an electricity in it. They put an elevator in it in one of the turrets, really. And um, it was interesting. It was like, it was the first season was interesting. After that, it was like, meh. Um, but yeah, it's incredible how inflated the real estate in Canada is and what the money can buy elsewhere, right? And I mean, France, I don't know about France. I've seen, I've seen lots of very concerning things about France. Very concerning. I don't know. I'd go there. But I mean, the real estate's a lot cheaper. So maybe it's a lot better. Who knows? Kirk is responding to this. Flight attendants from Pakistan keep skipping out on return trips after arriving in Toronto. Two more PIA flight attendants go missing in Canada. Um, so it says Khan has also been willing to point fingers, telling the website Arab News last month. The reason for this is the overly liberal asylum and asylum program by the Canadian government. So yeah, that's not so good. Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulation states that foreign nationals do not need to obtain a temporary resident visa if they seek to enter and remain in Canada as a flight crew member. So if you become a flight crew member in Pakistan and you want to come to Canada, you just get off with all the passengers and then you disappear and then you're, you don't have a flight attendant job anymore, but you are now Canadian. So there you go. Pretty wild, right? And immigration, right? Who needs to pay anybody? You just become a flight attendant. Ooh, scary stuff. And Wokeness is highlighting the New York mayor's comments on the flood of illegal migrants in New York. He and he says Mayor Eric Adams says that the qualities of quality of life in New York will continue to decline because of the illegals. Here we go. We're seeing uh, the erosion of the quality of life that we've improved on in such a short period of time of this administration, and we have been impacted uh, for for many uh, months. We were able to keep the visualization of this crisis from hitting our streets, but we have reached a breaking point. We're no longer able to do that because of the volume and numbers. Just last week, we had 3,900 people that arrived here. We are averaging anywhere from 2,500 to close to 4,000 a week. And if you do the math, you see that's 8,000 every two weeks, potentially 16,000 a month that we must feed, clothe, house, educate children, and all the services that you would give a normal adult. And we're seeing that play out on our streets of New York. And that is what the breaking point looks like, what we are experiencing right now. Take them to an airport. You put them on a plane. Fly them home. See you later. Bye. Bon voyage. Arrivederci. <laughs> I don't. I don't know anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, right. See you later, guys. And then if somebody tries to like, how? What? Why? Why are you responsible if migrants show up in New York? Why is New York all of a sudden responsible to just feed and clothe? Why are they responsible for that? That seems insane. That seems bonkers, crazy. So they got there. Right, like it's time to um, send them home. I think probably right. There's, there is. This is an invasion, and what is going on is a, a milking of the taxpayers' productivity through municipal t- 
taking care of people, right? And I mean, they get what, put up in hotels, all sorts of nice stuff. Um, the taxpayer is on the hook for all of that. There only is one taxpayer, right? Like you're it. You're looking at the mirror. You're, you're looking at them in the mirror. Sai says, I'm wondering if Japan will actually go through with this. Japan is about to become an immigration powerhouse. 350,000 people entered in the first half of 2023 alone. Those, those are uh, Canada numbers. Holy smoke. By 2030, a projected 10% of the workforce could be foreigners. Wow. Can you imagine going to Japan and wow, wow. The whole idea of nations and countries is being broken down in front of our eyes. And it doesn't seem like anybody's batting an eye at it. It seems incredible that nobody really is paying any attention. National Post is saying delivery of Canada's F-35 fighter jets could be delayed. Extra costs possible depending on the length of the delay. Canada's taxpayers could have to spend between $400 million and $700 million extra for stealth fighters. So... It's. I mean, are you surprised? I'm not surprised by any of this. But I, I'm. I'm actually. It's totally predictable that these fighters are going to be delayed and they're going to be more expensive. So this is. I, Justin Trudeau campaigned on fixing Harper's mistake on, on getting planes, and they still haven't acquired the planes. It's it's wild. Here's concerned citizen. He says, "When can we have a serious grown-up conversation about what's going, uh, what this is for?" and the possible impacts on everyone and everything. Yeah, we had a rain event in Ontario. This is, um, this is, oops, sorry about that. I didn't realize that the music was playing there. So apologies, I'm going to mute that. Um, but this is skies. It looks like uh, spray in skies. And so we had a big rain event in Ontario the other day. And um, I was looking outside and I thought to myself, if this was, if this was all snow, I would be shoveling snow for hours today. Like half of me is grateful that it's rain, but the other half is very, very angry at the people who are robbing my children of digging in the snow for the day while the adults struggle with the snow blower and try to try to dig out from, from this snow event. But it was absolutely hammering down and it wasn't even really windy. It was just coming straight down. Like if it was snow, it would have been inches in minutes. It was it was unbelievable, right? And so I, the reason that I think, honestly, that we are not having any snow this year uh, has to do with the, the amount of spraying we saw through the summer. And I mean, uh, again, people on the Canada Poly chat, we were all talking about what our skies look like. And it was a dramatic difference from previous years. I'd never noticed spraying before this year. It was undeniable. So uh, pretty wild stuff. With, re with regards to the skies and the weather. And I feel like we're being robbed of wintertime in order to push the climate change narrative, which is not great. Here is the Babylon Bee, and they're right, they're right on with this one. I thought this was funny. Yeah, Canada requires all men's rooms to have tampons in case of Justin Trudeau visit. <laughs> great job, great job, brava, hilarious. Here's Justin Trudeau being asked by a kid, why do you stick the middle finger up to the West? And uh, kids are funny. Kids are pretty funny. I'm gonna turn this down. Here we go. Nice and good and smart? Yeah, I mean, is are these adjectives you'd use to describe Justin Trudeau? Really, in politics, you do have to make uh, big decisions. And whenever you make this big decisions, there's going to be people who agree with it and people who don't disagree with it. Uh, and uh, some of the decisions my father made, uh, there were a number of people who disagreed with uh, quite intensely. Uh, and they didn't always get along the best way. Uh, but he always thought about what was right for Canada and worked very, very hard to try and build a better... No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. He talks about his dad a little bit more and then he says, ultimately, you have to be confident in yourself and the decisions that you, well, he's, he's talking here, but I don't really want to listen to him anymore. Um, <clears throat> I think an election's coming up. Here's Pierre Polyev doing the other video that I was talking about, the four minute long video. So Justin Trudeau's kind of bread and butter are these uh, town halls, but <clears throat> you'll notice this one is with children. So, right. Um, Mr. Polyev's 
bread and butter is a little bit different with these short um, videos or short documentaries, things like that. I'm not going to play this one, but this one is about the bring it home slogan. And Polyev goes deep on what does bring it home mean. He talks about the different meanings of bring it home and all the rest. It's a five minute long video. It's effective. It was released December 26. So he's got a very clear release schedule. Again, it just feels very election-y. Um, Shane Grath says it'll be so much better when Team Blue is installing digital IDs, mass importing hostages into the Ponzi scheme that is Canada's economy by the millions, and most importantly, hitting every UN SDG target by 2030. It'll be so different, guys. I can't wait. So yeah, I mean, it's a very slogan heavy conversation. It's not satisfying for people who are looking for meaty policy or talking about the things that are really wrong with what's going on. Um, but Mr. Polyev understands his audience isn't really interested in that. Um, and again, the meaty policy stuff is supposed to be the documentary I started the show with. So that's supposed to satisfy people like you and I. And while I think it's compelling, interesting work, I don't know that it's addressing all the real issues. If he doesn't talk about immigration to f fix the housing problem, and he hasn't, then and I mean, he has, but he hasn't promised to tie immigration to housing or bring down immigration to to meet the housing supply that we've got to got to spare, right? And at this point in time, we don't have any. So he hasn't committed to that. He's just confirmed that he is understanding the problem. And again, that's not good enough for me. Here's Canada Proud, and they're highlighting this. Here's what the Trudeau Liberals have in store for us in 2024, which is next week. How much in Trudeau's raising your taxes in 2024? Payroll tax is $347 per year. Carbon tax, 17 cents per liter. Alcohol tax, 4.7% per drink. Time to stop drinking, right? But that's what they want. Oh. Here's Jagmeet Singh getting in on the electioneering. This is 30 seconds. I find that a lot of Jagmeet Singh's clips feel a lot longer. Eva Chipek's weighing in on this. She says, I can't believe he said this out loud and proud. Let's keep in making the conservatives mad in 2024. Is that the plan? How is this Jagmeet Singh and NDP's strategy for next year? This is not about Canadians. This is about, this is about the game of politics, right? So here's Jagmeet Singh and 30 seconds. It's more, it, it feels longer than it is. Here we go. Let's talk about the three things Pierre Polyev blames the New Democrats for. He blames us for getting kids and seniors dental care. He blames New Democrats for taking on grocery CEOs who are jacking up the price of your food. He blames us for calling out his friends, those housing profiteers who make it impossible for you to find a home you can afford. If helping Canadians is why Pierre Polyev is blaming us, then let's keep on making them mad in 2024. Let's talk. Right? It feels longer than it is, but um, fundamentally, all of the things, all of the successes that Jigmeet Singh is claiming are not really successes. It's, it's misinterpretations of what they're, quote, delivering, right? And I just, I don't think they've delivered anything. I think that they've enabled the liberals to continue flooding the country, making housing more expensive. They've enabled the liberals to continue increasing the carbon, carbon price, making everything else more expensive. And so all of those things lead to them actually harming Canadians rather than hurt, helping Canadians. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to canadapoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.